Wa and Professor Yang Yang. Um, I just want to take a moment uh, to introduce um, Lauren Steinman, who will be introducing the lecture series. Uh, and a word of thanks on behalf of Religious Studies at McGill University to the Steinman family, uh, to Linda Stein uh, and family for their contribution uh, to the academic life, the intellectual life of McGill University through this multi-year lecture series uh, dedicated uh, uh, to the memory of the late Seymour David Steinman. Uh, Lauren Steinman, uh, the, the daughter of uh, Seymour David Steinman, is, is also a PhD student in the School of Religious Studies at McGill University. Uh, her own research is focused on violent and extremist movements, both on the right and on the left, the problem of politicized hate speech, uh, the, the complex debates in, uh, around uh, the rights of religious minorities, free speech, the problem of the securitization of religious minorities, and, uh, and, um, and the struggle with uh, the emerging movements, emerging extremist movements that have been part of a feature, I guess a feature of modernity, but more in particular, in recent decades, the emergence of these more religious forms of politicized and extremist movements have become a uh, feature of late modernity. So uh, with that, uh, uh, I'm sure we have a, an exciting evening before us, and I'll turn the floor over to Lauren Steinman. Good evening. I would like to take this moment to welcome you to the lecture series in memory of my father, Seymour David Steinman. The Judeo-Christian tradition is replete with laws and teachings that instruct individuals on how to live a life of dignity and righteousness. It is within this framework that we are called to an adherence of the Ten Commandments, which stipulate a series of laws that God delivered to Moses in the book of Exodus. The Fifth Commandment states that one should honor one's parents in the context of their lifetime. While I adhered to this precept throughout my past childhood and adult years, it is this principle which informs the present lecture series. It is through this project that I have chosen to readapt the commandment to honor the memory of a departed parent, my father, Seymour David Steinman. The Mourner's Kaddish represents the traditional prayer that Jews recite upon losing a sibling, child, spouse, or parent. The prayer makes no mention of the deceased, nor the concepts of loss and mourning, and solely speaks of God's greatness. In essence, the prayer is an affirmation of the belief in the Almighty and His unlimited power. This acknowledgement of our human vulnerability when faced with God's judgment is particularly profound for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. The prayer represents a statement that benefits the soul of the deceased and allows those who are living to maintain a connection with those who have passed. Moving beyond the question of Jewish tradition and the customary recitation of the Kaddish prayer, it is through this lecture series that I actively memorialize my father and honor his love and passion for knowledge and learning. My late father, Seymour David Steinman, was a graduate of McGill University, having obtained his Bachelor of Arts in 1959 and a Civil Law degree in 1960. One of his most distinctive traits was his inquisitive mind. He was ever curious about the complex dimensions of the contemporary world and sought to leave no stone unturned in his quest for knowledge. My father was highly interested in current events and was intrigued by the disciplines of political science, religion, and history. In his later years, he had been enrolled in a master's program at McGill in the Department of Jewish Studies. He felt rooted deeply in his identity as a Jewish Canadian, both through tradition and the wider culture. He was profoundly concerned by the ongoing problem of anti-Semitism and its impact on Jewish communities worldwide, in addition to the increasing presence of nativist ideological rhetoric in contemporary political discourse. Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, Chief Rabbi of England, argues that a parent is defined in terms of his or her ability to adopt the role of teacher. In a sense, my father was one of my very first teachers, who provided me instruction on basic life lessons 
from what it means to be a Jewish woman in the modern era to what it means to be involved as a more, to being involved as a righteous and morally upstanding citizen of this country. He taught me a great deal about respect for others and the value of acknowledging the beauty of human difference. In the last three years, the underpinnings of Western democracy have begun to demonstrate signs of unraveling. There has been a destabilization of certain values that represent the cornerstone belief of democratic states, most notably within the domain of human rights and fundamental freedoms. There has been a significant emergence of populist governmental regimes whose ideological tenets emulate those of totalitarian and fascist states. These governments seek to act divisibly against their citizens. They engage in an ongoing game of identity politics where discrimination against minorities on the basis of gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and religious affiliation have become treated as acceptable forms of rhetorical discourse that ultimately aim to shatter the liberal democratic values of pluralism and multiculturalism. It is from this morally problematic breeding ground that extremist ideologies and movements take shape. And we have a duty as citizens of this world to ground our ethics in something greater than the universal attributes of humanity which some of the great philosophers attempted in their time. As Rabbi Sachs articulates, Kant based his ethics on the foundation of reason and then them rooted it in the notion of consequences. Hume attributed ethics to certain basic emotions such as sympathy, empathy, and compassion, while Adam Smith, the notable pioneer of capitalism, predicated his system of ethics on the capacity to stand back from situations and judge them through impartial detachment. As Sachs argues, all of these models possess their own virtues, but none has been entirely infallible. This is where Judaism diverges from other components of worldviews and offers a different and distinct perspective, namely that the guardian of conscience is our capacity for memory. The political structures of free societies depend significantly on the passing on of cultural memory. It is our duty to never forget the errors committed by past civilizations that have brought about immeasurable suffering, toil, violence, and bloodshed. Our capacity to remember the horrific events of genocide, terrorism, mass murder, and other crimes against humanity is the sole means by which we can protect our society from these dangerous threats and safeguard the fundamental liberal values that underpin our democracy. The goal of this lecture series is to bridge together my current PhD research with my father's personal interest in social diversity and the problems of systemic discrimination that target minority groups and vulnerable populations in the contemporary world. As a doctoral student specializing in the domain of religion, ethics, and public policy, I believe that the subject matter of the event is highly relevant to the present day social climate of increasing racial, ethnic, and religious discrimination that is plaguing Western democracies. On each night throughout the series, there will be two guest speakers presenting separate lectures. These presentations will be on a specific theme related to a number of significant questions which concern the problem of hate, discrimination, extremism, and violence that target religious communities, as well as other minority groups. Lectures will examine issues around a range of topics, including Christian fundamentalism and far-right extremism, neo-Nazism and white supremacy, Islamophobia, Bill 21, and Quebec society, secularism, religious freedom, religious visibility in the public sphere, anti-Semitism, hate speech, immigration in the 21st century, and the question of religious and ethnic minority rights in democracies, the latter of which brings to bear the complex and deeply rooted relationship between religion and law. The central aim of this symposium of lectures is to bring people together to honor my father's memory in the pursuit of knowledge of a series of topics that are highly pertinent to today's increasingly fragmented and globalized world. Ultimately, in honoring my father's memory tonight, it is my hope to stimulate dialogue between academic professors, students, and other members of the public who are interested in these issues, which are of great relevance to the domains of politics, sociology, public policy, and even religion more generally. With postmodern globalization and a significant number of advances in the domain of technology, there has been greater proliferation of hateful and discriminatory rhetoric, coupled with an increase in violent extremist movements. It is only through proper education and dialogue 
which brings to bear the importance of memory and the historical past that societies can collectively work towards countering these dark and divisive forces. I do hope that you will enjoy tonight's lectures. I believe that both presentations are highly pertinent to the underlying complexities that concern religious and cultural diversity and difference, as well as the ever-present problem of extremism and violence, which we, as Quebecers and as Canadians, are attempting to navigate and grasp in this ever-changing social landscape. I will now hand over the floor to Dr. Daniel Siri, Professor of Religion, Ethics, and Public Policy, to introduce tonight's guest speakers. But it focuses more on 
what we would call Christian groups. And if we have to kind of define what we, we mean by uh, the Christian right, what it is exactly, it is a religious coalition that has essentially political aims. It is a political religious coalition that is mainly comprised of what we would call conservative evangelicals, conservative Catholics, and conservative Protestants. Now, this political uh, coalition of religious groups, they have certain things in common. So they, they federate uh, around common causes such as anti-abortion activism, things like the uh, uh, opposition of the rights of LGBTQ people, uh, and sex education classes. They also speak out in favor of, pro of the promotion, especially in the context of the U.S., of the promotion of uh, prayer in schools and the teaching of creationism, so uh, or intelligence design. So uh, design. So it's very anti-evolutionary uh, uh, teaching. And of course, things like the fight against uh, uh, euthanasia and the safeguarding of what they call religious freedom. Because of course, the Christian right, one of the one of these issues, one of the issues that it has is this idea that their religious freedom is under attack. So of course, they want to get involved politically to defend those types of rights. Now, why do they engage politically? Why do we have, uh, and we'll see, we'll, we'll talk about several examples of the manifestation of the Christian right uh, even recently, and we hear a lot about the Christian right, especially coming out of uh, the US. But what is its motivation? What is its ideology? Where does it, like, where does it get its ideas? Why does it actually find it important to mobilize politically on some of these important social conservative issues? Where does that actually come from? So essentially, when we talk about the Christian right, they, 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 they embrace an ideology that we can call, and, and scholars are more and more uh, uh, using this expression and, and exploring this, this, this concept, uh, this idea that is called dominionism. Dominionism. Now, dominionism is essentially, if I, and, and to give you a kind of a, a short definition of what it is, and I, I have a, a colleague, a researcher, that has been working on this question in the US for the past 30 years. And uh, what's happening now in the U.S., he, he wrote about this 20 years back. And he started working on this issue of dominionism and the dominion theology in the 90s. And one of the things he, he, uh, he realized is that he had to clearly define what that meant. What do we mean by dominionism? And how does the Christian right actually uh, use this type of ideology to mobilize uh, individuals into political action. So dominionism, in a nutshell, is essentially this. It is the theocratic idea that regardless of the theological view, means, or timetable, Christians are called by God to exercise dominion over every aspect of society by taking control of political and cultural institutions. So it's essentially a theocratic idea, okay? And it is, of course, it, it can touch any kind of, uh, it, it, you know, the theology, uh, it can embrace any kind of theological perspective, a, a specific Christian theological perspective, and even uh, a, a particular, what we would call eschatological perspective, or understanding of the end times. Uh, but the idea is that Christians are called to dominion. Christians are called to exercise dominion in every aspect of life and society. Now, where do they get this idea? They essentially get this idea through a reading that they do of the book of Genesis, a particular text in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 21, uh, to 28, a passage that we're very, very familiar with, 
uh, those that are familiar with the uh, uh, Judeo-Christian tradition in the book of Genesis that talks about the creation of humankind. And in that passage, it essentially says that God said to humankind as he was creating uh, human beings, he said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, when we read this passage, our impression is that this is something that God is calling humankind to exercise. That human beings are responsible, in a sense, to uh, manage a creation. But according to a dominionist perspective, this dominion, this exercise of dominion, is actually the responsibility of Christians. So it is not humankind, but it is Christians that are called to rule the earth. So this is essentially, starting from this particular type of reading of the book of Genesis, this becomes the, the, the kind of proof text on which dominion theology will be built. Now, when we talk about the Christian right itself, I define what it is in a sense, I define it as a political uh, coalition, right? a religious political coalition. But it is comprised of different types of of Christians. The Christian right, uh, you have all sorts of groups in there. Of course, we've talked about specific uh, groups like evangelicals and Catholics or Protestants, but uh, what kind of uh, ideas do they embrace? What kind of positions do they take? Essentially, when we talk about the Christian right, you have three types of Christians. You have conservative Christians, right? so Christians that are conservatives, Christians that are essentially share social conservative views, but do not necessarily embrace dominionism. They're not there to rule the world. They're not there to change the institutions. They're not there to uh, you know, create problems for the political institutions, social institutions. They're there because they have values and they want to bring their values to the fore. They want to just engage with society at a political level. So you have Christians that are conservatives that can be involved in politics. And sometimes they, of course, fall under the category of the Christian right. At the same time, you have other Christians that we can call Christian nationalists, where this is a little more than just social conservative values. This is, for example, you hear in the US this idea that the US was founded on uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition, huh? uh, that the US is a Christian nation. Uh, that Christianity should be the primary religion, that Christianity can, is not to be treated like any other religion, but it has a more prevalent, prevalent place in uh, American society. So you have Christian nationalists, and often Christian nationalists, they will embrace dominionist ideas. Uh, now, in that spectrum, you have those Christian conservatives, Christian nationalists, but you also have Christian theocrats, unfortunately, where you have these people that it's even more than that, that in fact, society should essentially be governed by God's laws. God's laws should be the basis of society. So God's laws are more than the Constitution. They, they have more value than the Constitution. They put emphasis, for example, on uh, social transformation and things like the Ten Commandments that should be at the basis of the laws of the land. Now, okay, this is these types of, on a spectrum of the types of Christians that you can find in what we call the Christian right. You have conservatives, you have nationalists, and you have people that have a tendency of embracing a bit theocratic ideas. 
Um, now, you have all sorts of groups. You see, I was talking, of course, about evangelicals and Catholics and Protestants, but you know, when we talk about evangelicals or even Catholics, there are many types of Catholics. There are many types of Protestants. There are many types of evangelicals. There are many types of different groups. So, in terms of groups, I, and I had a nice chart to show you, but it's okay. It doesn't work. It happens. Uh, so, imagine the chart in your mind. Okay? <laughs> so, I had a, a list of groups. I had a spectrum of groups. Uh, and it's interesting. There are many, many types of groups. Um, and I think of certain groups that really, in the past, I would say, 50 to 60 years, really embraced this idea of dominionism and tried to push it in the political realm, especially in America. One of those groups is what is called Christian Reconstructionism. Christian Reconstructionism was, was founded by a, an individual, a Presbyterian, a Calvinist Presbyterian, by the name of Rusas Rushduni in the 60s. And Rushduni, for him, there's no difference, for example, between the, uh, the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament and the New Testament. All of this is comprised of God's will and God's laws, and God's laws apply across the board to Christians. God's laws in the Hebrew Bible, God's laws in the New Testament. This is the will of God. And Rushduni went to the point of, you know, if we're really serious about pleasing God, this means that there will be pen penalties for sin. For example, people in committing adultery will be will have the consequences that you read in, in some of the Hebrew Bible uh, books. Uh, some will be put to death and things like that. So Rishuni was, was really much in favor of applying God's laws literally. And this was the responsibility of Christians to bring about this reality in American society. Of course, his first ultimate goal was American society, but this was to uh, you know, spill over across the world. So Christian Reconstructionism is about reconstructing society as a Christian society. So Rajduni, this, this individual in the 60s and 70s, wrote a lot of things. He wrote a lot of books. And uh, he wasn't a popular figure. He wasn't in the media everywhere. But a lot of key political players that were Christians and felt that America was was losing its way, uh, were reading Rishuni. And they started being influenced by Rishuni's uh, political thinking. And eventually that affected uh, and motivated in the 80s the rise of the Christian right and the moral majority at that time. And uh, this is one group, for example, that is very, very extreme. And in, in, in their vision of, of things, uh, there should be theocracy. Okay? And they focused on the idea of what we call theonomy, which is God's law. So God's law should be the law of society. So you have, for example, this type of group. Now, not every Christian was necessarily uh, comfortable with the ideas or the extreme ideas of Christian Reconstructionists. They felt, you know, maybe it's, 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 it's going a bit too far to stone people to death because of their sins, for example put people to death because they, they committed adultery or, or they stole something or whatever. So it's a bit too extreme. But they still felt that their responsibility as Christians was to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. They wanted to fulfill Jesus' prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So how can we do that? You see, this is our responsibility as Christians. How can, we, how can we bring about this kind of reality? So eventually what happened is this kind of dominionism that was a bit uh, harsh kind of softened itself, but it was still dominionism, and it found its way into other types of groups that were more charismatically leaning. Uh, groups like certain Pentecostal groups, charismatic groups, and I'm thinking about a particular group in, per, in, 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 in particular, uh, a group that's called the New Apostolic Reformation that, was, uh, that came on, on, on the scene in, in the early 2000s. Uh, the founder is uh, C. Peter Wagner. And uh, Wagner also embraced this idea of dominionism, but Wagner was a charismatic. 
individual. So he believed in the spiritual gifts. He believed in the restoration of what they call the fivefold ministries of prophets, apostles, and, and pastors, and evangelists, and teachers. And uh, from that, his strategy was essentially a strategy not from not a top-down strategy, but a bottom-up strategy, where essentially Christians were called to permeate society and change it from the inside. Okay? So placing strategic individuals in strategic social places to transform society in order to bring about what they consider to be the kingdom of God. Now, when we talk in terms of these types of ideas, remember I was telling you about uh, dominionism as uh, a theocratic idea that doesn't really, uh, is not stuck up in, in terms of its timetable. And when we talk about timetable, we talk about often what is called eschatology. Eschatology is the doctrine of the end time. So there are many Christians today that believe that, that Jesus, for example, is coming back soon. And we hear that. Right? I'm sure you've come across you know, prosperity preachers on your television screen saying that you know, Christians need to, be, to, to, to get ready because the rapture is coming and Christians will be raptured and, and God will bring judgment on this world. But Christians will be raptured from this earth and they will be spared the wrath of God. So a lot of people, a lot of Christians think that, you know, these are the end times. These are the last days. Now, for dominionists, there's no problem with respect to the end times. Uh, Christians, some Christians can still believe that the end times will be soon. Other Christians that have a more long-term view on the end times uh, think that, you know, no, there's no such thing about the fact that Jesus is coming back soon. We need to construct the kingdom here and prepare the coming of Christ so we have to build the kingdom in this world so they have a more long-term view about the kingdom. Uh, they can embrace dominionist ideas too. So independently of your eschatological perspective, you can embrace dominionism. You can involve yourself in changing the social structures so that Christians will rule somehow in society. Okay? And you don't have to adopt a particular eschatological perspective over another. There's no need for that. Now, this brings us to today. I've just kind of given you a bit of a background with some ideas and concepts. What's the Christian right? What is the dominionism? How does the Christian right actually use the dominionism? What is its uh, ideology, it is dominionist in nature. Now, if we talk about our situation today, let's go back just a couple of years, 2016, with the election of Donald Trump. Now, you know, we hear everything on social media, we hear people saying all sorts of stuff on, on social media, uh, Trump is an idiot, uh, those that voted for him are idiots, you know, you have everything on social media, positive, negative, like it's, it's crazy, it's, it's a melting pot of all sorts of stuff. Now, what we know for sure about the election of Trump is that 81% of white evangelicals that call themselves or label themselves as born-again evangelicals voted for Trump in 2016. Okay? They, they voted for Trump in 2016. That's, that, that is a lot of people. There's 62 million evangelicals okay? uh, in, in America. So that's, uh, that's a big chunk of that. That's over 30 million that voted for Trump. Now, this means, in a sense, what's, what's interesting about this is they had an impact. And they, they had a reason to vote for him. And what we've seen in the past two years, two and a half years, three years, is we've seen all sorts of policies come out of the White House. We've seen issues around anti-LGBTQ rights. We're now seeing issues around uh, anti-abortion. And certain states are, are kind of opening up this, this uh, question and, and uh, uh, bringing a, about legislation against uh, abortion. Uh, we've seen a lot of issues around immigration. You've heard about the Muslim ban. You, we constantly hear about the wall uh, at the Mexican-American border. 
Um, we're also talking, and, and we hear about uh, even a second, uh, a possible second American Civil War. Uh, we have this type of rhetoric. Uh, some, some, some Christian leaders uh, that belong to the Christian right say that, for example, the abortion issue will generate in the American population uh, the possibility of a second American Civil War. Now, the issue of, of Trump's impeachment might bring about this, this kind of second American uh, Civil War. And you have prominent Christian right pastors in the U.S. that support Trump uh, that are embracing this kind of rhetoric and that are polarizing the electorate. And they're energizing, in a sense, this base of individuals that voted for Trump. Even some people that are saying, amongst these, these Christian right leaders that are saying that it is sin to vote against Trump. So why, why are we there? Like, what are the causes for these types of groups to take a position that seems to be uh, so far from what they had experienced under the Obama administration? You're going from one, one, one end of the spectrum to the other. What, what is the cause? What are the causes? Are there causes? I wrote, a, 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 I read a very interesting book by Robert uh, Lufnow, who is an anthropologist, uh, who's very much interested in religion and politics and religion and society in American, uh, in in America. And he wrote a book called The Left Behind. And one of the things he wanted to know is why people voted for Trump. And he he's actually from the the. Ah! He's actually. <laughs> <laughs> it appeared. Okay, we're getting there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, see those nice charts? Okay. <laughs> see those nice charts? This is all for you. Uh, but we, we missed it. But it's okay. It's okay. I'll, I'll miss you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Okay, so go for it. Okay, we're good. I'll change it as we go from there. Okay, another one. Another one. Okay, there we go. Okay, listen up. This is his book, The Left Behind. Thank you so much. Uh, and in his book, he tried to figure out, he went back to the Midwest and tried to figure out what were some of the issues that uh, generated this, this kind of vote for Trump. And he realized that a lot of people had grievances. They had grievances against the previous administration. A lot of people felt that they had not been listened to. A lot of people felt that they were marginalized. Their voices didn't count under the Obama administration. So they had all sorts of issues. First of all, we know that two-thirds of people living in rural areas voted for him. So this is some of the uh, information that he, uh, that he gathers from uh, his uh, anthropological and sociolo sociological work. And as he was talking with, with people, uh, a lot of individuals said that they felt a profound resentment from Washington because they felt that Washington or the big government was encroaching on their own personal lives, on their own liberties. They felt that they did not have any rights anymore, that everything was decided in Washington, and they had no say, and they were tired of it, okay? So this idea of draining the swamp, right, that what we, heard, we hear constantly Trump uh, saying, and this resonated with them. Communities felt threatened. They, they, they weren't uncomfortable with ideas of abortion and same-sex marriage. They were, they were uncomfortable and they, they, they reacted against diversity. They weren't used to religious diversity, racial diversity, cultural diversity. So they had all of these grievances and they felt that someone like Trump, despite his background, despite his you know, extramarital affairs, despite that maybe his ethics did not correspond to their own values. They still consider Trump to be someone that God would use because he listened to them and to their concerns. And of course Trump has, or the evangelicals at least, these white evangelicals now have the ear of Trump. Okay? They live, Trump listens to them because he knows this is, uh, these are his base. So, you have all of these grievances, you see? Now, if you have grievances, and if you want to do something with that, grievances alone don't, are not sufficient to mobilize individuals into political action. 
You need grievances and you need ideology. And this reminds me of a famous quote by Peter Newman, who was formerly uh, the director of the Center for Radicalization at King's College. Now he's just a professor and someone else in his place. Uh, but he said something very interesting in terms of grievances, the relationship between grievances, what people, you know, the, the issues that they have, and ideology. Essentially, ideology without grievances does not resonate, and grievances without ideology are not acted upon. So you need both. You see, so you have people that can have grievances, but if, if there's no ideology to actually motivate them to action, to political action, to actually change things, they're not going to do anything. You see? And it's not just ideology itself. So they need grievances. So the combination of grievances with dominion theology, with preachers that are not politicizing everything, this is the perfect combination to actually get people, you know, mobilize people politically to effectuate the change that they see as being necessary. You see? So this is the consequence of this. Now, we are at about a year and a half from the next election. And what's at stake for them? You see, these, these individuals, this, this, I would consider this, this kind of group as a kind of social radicalized group, religious group at the moment in America. What's at stake for them? Everything at stake. If Trump is not reelected, they lose everything that they feel they have gained under him. So what's at stake? It reminds me that I, I, I came across an interesting quote by Michael Brown, who is uh, uh, a fundamentalist Christian, and I would say identifies pretty much with, with Christian right ideas uh, in, in the U.S. It's very, very popular. It has a, 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 a large following. And uh, Brown says that uh, there's no way he could vote for a Democrat. And I have this quote, it's very interesting. He says for him, he's still going to vote for Trump despite any kind of Democrat that presents himself or himself. He says, in the same way when it comes to the uh, economy, if it's Trump versus a socialist, he has my vote. The same when it comes to religious liberties, or standing with Israel, or pushing back against radical LGBT activism. Trump gets my vote, and the liberal media won't shame me out of it. That's what it says to it. You see, so they feel that they have gained a lot under uh, Trump's presidency. They feel that they have a, a, a ear. They, they feel that their voice counts. So anything, it's very hard to change these people's minds, you see? And it's not Trump's... Um, actions in the moral sphere that's going to change it. Because some of them even qualify Trump as a new Cyrus. Do you know who King Cyrus was in the Bible? Huh? This important Persian king that permitted uh, the Jews to go back to their, to their land and rebuild their city and rebuild their temple. Trump is compared to Cyrus. Cyrus in the book of Isaiah is called the Messiah. Okay, so Trump is, you, you can scan the literature of Christian right uh, leaders, they compare it to Cyrus, to, King, to Queen Esther, uh, they compare uh, Trump to Moses, they compare Trump to King David, name it. And for them, they're, they're even going to admit, Trump is not necessarily my religious leader, but he is the political leader that we need. Okay? So this is very important, right? To what extent they're, they're really ready to go. Now, do you remember I was telling you about the, uh, the New Apostolic Reformation? Now, the New Apostolic Reformation was, was founded by C. Peter Wagner in 2001. Because, of course, uh, again, they started adopting ideas of dominionism. He wrote this very important book called Dominion. And one of the things that's important for researchers like us is to actually read their literature, to actually read people's primary sources. What do they say about their political ideas? What are they, what are they talking about their, you know, in terms of their policies? What do they want to do? And in this book, he, he clearly states 
that uh, what's important is that despite the fact that they don't embrace Christian reconstructionists that are for them maybe extreme ideas, they still embrace dominionism. They still believe in the fact that God wants Christians to rule in order for them to establish his kingdom in preparation for the second coming of Christ. Now, how do they go about this? They go about this this way. They go about this, and this comes to my title, Conquering for Jesus. They conceptualize society as being comprised of what they call the seven mountains of culture. Now, the seven mountains of culture are divided into various areas of life that we are familiar with, and you have them here. You have arts and entertainment, business, education, family, government, media, and religion. Now, the goal of people like that belong to this, this, this movement called the New Apostolic Reformation is to permeate these mountains of culture and attain the summit of those, of those mountains in order to transform the culture of those areas of society. And when they manage to do that, this is how the kingdom of God comes on. Now, I will read you a long quote, and it's significant. Bear with me, because this illustrates exactly their strategy. This is a quote from Lance Walnow, who is now probably the number one I would call it the Seven Mountains Mandate Guru. Okay? <laughs> Seven Mountains Mandate Guru, Lance Walnut. He co-edited a book called Invading, Invading Babylon. He says this concerning this strategy. Social transformation. How he envisions social transformation for the kingdom. He says, the business of shifting culture or transforming nations does not require a majority of conversions. We make a mistake when we focus on winning a harvest in order to shape a culture. Together, Protestant and Catholics make up a 70% majority of the, US, of the US population, and such already have a majority consensus on key matters affecting marriage and abortion. Yet, they are still incapable of being more than a firewall to the minority who are advancing a same-sex ideology. If we do not need more conversions to shift a culture, what do we need? We need more disciples in the right places, the high places. Minorities of people can shape the agenda, if properly aligned and deployed. The greatest gain in gay rights occurring during the 10 years of our most conservative presidencies and the movement has never been larger than 5 to 6% of the population. The church lacked cultural power because it focuses on changing the world from within the church mountain rather than releasing the church into the marketplace. The goal is to be the church that raises up disciples who go into all the world. Taking the gospel into all the world is no longer a simple journey of geography. The world is a matrix of overlapping systems and spheres of influence. We are called to go into the entire matrix and invade every system with an influence that liberates that system's full potential. Each sphere has its unique structure, culture, and stronghold of thinking, a worldview of its own. The battle in each sphere is over the ideas that dominate that sphere and between the individuals who have the most power to advance those ideas. The church must be represented in each sphere if the power of darkness is to be broken. Now, do you understand how they conceptualize and even how they understand society? They understand society to be under the influence of the powers of darkness. And their responsibility is to permeate those spheres and change those spheres, change the mentalities, change the cultures of those spheres and bring about the kingdom of God. Okay? This is dominionism. This is dominionism. It is stealth. Huh? You don't see it, but it, it grows gradually. 
And this is the example that we have in the U.S. This is what we see in the U.S. My colleagues were writing about what's happening now in the U.S. 20 years back, and they were warning people in the U.S. about being careful about the separation of church and state. And people were dismissing what they were telling them. Be careful about the meaningless ideas that are penetrating the political realm. And now people are realizing, and, and journalists are starting to write about this. And my colleagues were saying, see, we, we told you about this, but you, you didn't do the warning. Now, I'm, I'm going to go very uh, rapidly uh, with the two, three last slides because I have my colleague that has uh, something to say tonight, too. So, what do they do to mobilize the troops? They need, uh, of course, a strategy. One of their strategies is called spiritual warfare. So they engage in conceptualizing everything that doesn't correspond to their worldview as being the enemy. And they are engaged in a battle that is a spiritual battle, but in the end, that really does a lot of harm because of how it characterizes people that are not in their own camp, you see? So they use a lot of spiritual warfare language. Right? To conquer, to conquer these mountains, one needs to engage in spiritual warfare against what they consider to be demonic forces controlling people in these spheres. You see, these people in these spheres that are bad influences for society, they're under demonic control. Okay? Now, the warfare language, when you read this, this is just three books. Like, I have like 20 books. Like this. Okay? And there are more and more, and there, there's, there are people writing, still writing on this day. Okay? Taking our city for, cities for God. God's weapons of war. You know? Uh, so the language that is used is very similar to the biblical stories that we find of the conquest of the promised land. Uh, if you read some of the narratives in uh, the book of Numbers, for example, Exodus, um, Deuteronomy, and, 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 and you know, in the Pentateuch, you're, you're going to see stories about conquering the promised land. So sometimes America is compared to the promised land. We have to reconquer this promised land. Or when it's compared, or the language that is used is uh, America is Babylon. We have to invade the evil city of Babylon and turn it over to God. Okay, so this language is used, but how do they penetrate? Those spheres, they penetrate. How do they engage in social transformation? They engage in social transformation by having what they call, what they call apostles in the marketplace. Now, an apostle, the word apostle, essentially means one who is sent. In Christianity, it's one who is sent by God. When Jesus calls his apostles, Jesus sends his apostles. So, apostolos means to be sent. Now, they are sent. For them, apostles are not people that should be in churches. Apostles are people that are in churches that are trained in churches in, in what they call apostolic centers to go back into their spheres of influence, which is the marketplace. You see, they go back into the marketplace. So essentially, that's what they're they're doing. They're calling uh, for apostles to be part of society and change society. Now, what are we to do? And I'm going to finish with this. This is a long quote, but I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to summarize what it said. This is a quote at the end of uh, Woodenow's book. Because at the end, he was a bit discouraged with everything that he was discovering in relation to the grievances that people had, why they voted for Donald Trump in 2016. And at the end, he says, you know, I'm a liberal. I've always voted Democrat. I was always for, I voted for, for, for Hillary, for Obama. I have progressive values. But at the same time, all of this for me is very natural and very normal. And when I meet people that are radically different from me, my job as a scholar is to understand these people. Not to judge them, but to understand them. Understand where they're coming from and why they think the way they think. And in the end, when he says, what now, 
He says, I want to take, I want to take time to tell my colleagues, the producers of knowledge, the liberal progressive professors, those pro producers of knowledge, I want to tell them that America is not crazy. They are not crazy because they voted for Trump. They have grievances. And you need to understand that to address that. So in the end, let's have, as scholars, but us too, let's have the attitude that Spinoza had. I have striven not to laugh at human actions, not to weep at them, nor to hate them, but to understand it. That's what we should do. So thank you very much for your time.
Until recently, in scholarly work, in English, integrism was not accepted. Uh, usually, when we would talk about Catholic integrism, we would talk about it in English uh, as Catholic fundamentalism, which is false, because there's actually Catholic fundamentalism, it exists, but it's not the same as Catholic integrism. And I'm going to explain a little bit why. And recently, uh, I, I've been asked by the uh, Sage uh, Encyclopedia of the Sociology of Religion, that's going to come out in uh, 2020, an International Encyclopedia of Sociology of Religion. I've been asked to write the entry of integrism, because I've been fighting with my Anglophone colleagues for the last 20 years about <laughs> You're wrong, it's not fundamentalism, it's Catholic integrism. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to explain to you tonight, because it's, it's about to happen. So, as you know, I've been studying for the far right and uh, Catholic integrism in Quebec for the last three years. So it's not a new field, as you said before. Uh, it's a very old field, it's just that people are getting aware of it and uh, people are getting uh, money for it and now they're interested because you know, a guy a couple of years ago called Alexandre Bissonnet killed six Muslims at the Quebec mosque. Most of you don't know that Alexandre Bissonnet read, was a Catholic integrist. On his Facebook page, he had a uh, avatar picture of him as a crusader. Okay. And he's not the only one. Uh, even the leader of La Meurthe has a picture of that as a crusader. I'm going to talk a little bit about, about that later on. But coming back to cultural bias between what is Catholic integrism and Protestant fundamentalism. So, the difference between the two, and I'm going to be very brief, I did my whole thesis on that. Uh, Fundamentalism basically is different in two uh, it, it is different in two ways from inter Catholic integrism. Fundamentalism is historically comes from the U.S. the beginning of the uh, 20th uh, century. Um, it's a couple of books that were uh, wrote uh, in, uh, in reaction to Darwin's theory that we call uh, the fundamentals, a testimony to the truth. That's where fundamentalism comes. So, culturally, fundamentalism comes from the Protestant religion, and it calls to, uh, in terms of doctrine, to come back to the fundamentals, which are the Bible. Which is, you know, for Protestant, normal. Integrism is different also in two ways. It's culturally different because it came from France. It comes from a debate that happened in France in the uh, 19th century, at the end of the 19th century, between the Catholic integralist and the Catholic modernist. At the time, from the Vatican I Council, the Pope had uh, proclaimed that uh, the, 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 the Pope was infallible. He could not make an error. And at the time, two forces were pushing in the Catholic Church in France, one to modernize uh, the church, they were called the modernists, and the other ones to, to keep the uh, doctrine integral, they were called the integra integralists. So the integralists at the time were the dominating force. And they were called uh, by the their enemies, the modernists, they were called integrists. Okay? But it was at the time a, uh, a sort of an insult. Uh, but at the time they were the integrists. We go century after that, Vatican II in the 60s, the integrists lost and the modernists won and the Catholic Church was modernized. Well, unquote, because uh, some of you could say they're not modernized enough today. Uh, but uh, the, the, so the only the more the modernist uh, appellation disappeared because it's what is supposed to be uh, the church in 
1992 today, but the integrals stay because there are still inside the Catholic Church uh, uh, groups that are integrals that still fight for Vatican I, you know, for the church that is infallible, for the church that, as you say, should dominate the world, uh, that are still saying that the Catholic Church is the true faith and that the others are not true faiths. And these groups, I'm going to talk about some of them today. There are some of, the, uh, of them in Quebec today. But all of this to say that all of this misunderstanding is cultural bias. It comes from a cultural bias from Anglo culture and French culture between integrism and fundamentalism. They're not the same. And actually, inside the church in the 70s, there was a movement and you have that in a great book by a French theologian, Pierre Latulier, called Catholic Fundamentalism, who are Catholics who are more prone to talk about the Bible than the Magisterium, which is the Catholic law. So it's a great, great, great misunderstanding and cultural bias when my Anglo colleagues talk about Catholic Fundamentalism, which they do all the time. We're going to remedy that in the Encyclopedia. <laughs> So first, you have to make that difference, okay? Also, um, another cultural bias uh, comes from, a, a, and, it's, and it's an important one in the debate on Law 21, is between secularism and laicite. They're not the same, okay? Usually the anglophones, when they, when they translate laicite, they say secularism. They don't mean the same thing. But again, it comes from a cultural bias. There's no such thing in most Anglo-Saxon countries. There's no such thing as laïcité. Laïcité came originally from France and was exported by France to some other countries. Actually, one of the most laïcité countries today would be Turkey, which is really strange because they have a, <laughs> an almost, I would say, theocratic, but a Muslim government. But it's the most uh, laïcité country uh, when they founded the country, it was founded on laïcité by Atatürk. So, the model of laïcité uh, means basically uh, that it is a separation of church and state, but also that uh, uh, in terms of religion, religion should be, not that religion should disappear, that religion should be, uh, should be, uh, ostracized, but that religion should be a private affair. You should manifest the sign of religion at home. You can do whatever you like in the bedroom, as they say, okay, but not, uh, not publicly. So laïcité is deeply rooted in French history, and as you can understand, in uh, French culture in Quebec. So that's where laïcité comes. But secularism is a bit more, when you translate it, uh, secularism means, you know, the disappearing, the slow, dis in, a, in terms of sociological concepts, secularism means the slow disappearing of religion from society. <clears throat> so you understand that when you translate laïcité to secularism, you put to the term laïcité a negative connotation that the religion is going to slowly disappear from society. The secularism a movement that all sociologists in all the world noted in the last 40 years, 60 years, was, was a concept that was explaining how religion was slowly disappearing from the public sphere in society. Uh, and some of them would go even further saying that uh, so religion totally disappeared. Uh, it did not. Uh, and the secularism theory was, a, in a sense, a failure because religion came back, uh, as you explained, to a bit of a war. And, um, and, uh, but not in the nicest, the religion came back with a war, but, a war, but not in, in, its, in its nicest manifestation. Uh, we can see today that mainstream religion is going down, but fundamentalist religion and integrist religion is going up. So, uh, it would be very long to explain all of it and have much to say. So, cultural biases first between laïcité and secularism, between integrism and fundamentalism. Really important to understand, because when you start a debate on Law 21 or on 
uh, Catholic religion in Quebec, and you don't understand these cultural biases that comes from two different languages and culture, you're starting very, very bad. So, uh, Adam, you? I'm okay. Okay. Um, so we're we're gonna do a small portrait now of the far right in Quebec, knowing these things. Um, with its link with what I call a Catholic culture, or uh, uh, also an integrist or intransigent culture. Um, contrary to popular belief, and it's uh, been uh, a, a sort of a fire of mine with, with, with all of my uh, colleagues from Quebec. When I started uh, my center a few years ago, a great political science from you, Mr. Sherbrooke, that I work with, uh, David Morin, who was the UNESCO chair uh, in Quebec on the prevention of radicalization, came to my college, we organized a conference, and he told me there is no religion in the far right. Most political science, you know, they say, oh, far right is only political. There's no religion in that, a political scientist. You know. I'm a sociologist of religion, so I beg to differ. And it's, it's sort of been demonstrated itself since then. But um, again, you're going to have a sort of a, uh, of a cultural bias. Because when you talk about Jewish religion, when you talk about Muslim religion, automatically the extremist movement in these religion is associated with religion. But have you ever asked yourself the question, why in Quebec we are, even the scholars, are dissociating Christianism from the far right? They never talk about religion. It's always political, it's always the far right. There's no religion in the far right. Even the people that I interview in the far right say, oh, I don't believe in religion. Okay. Um, I've been studying this for the last 30 years. Uh, right now I, I just got a funding, richer funding from Public Safety Canada to study the far right in Quebec for the next three years with my friend André. And I've already started to do many interviews with many people from the many groups uh, in the far right in Quebec. Groups like Lamont, groups like the Soldier of Rodin. A uh, year and a half, uh, two years, I uh, organized a conference uh, at my college, Cégep de Barmonti, on the south shore of Montreal, you know, outside of Montreal. Have <laughs> you been there? Don't draw the college in Montreal. Uh, you'll see why I'm, I'm joking about this later on. But I organized this conference and I'm doing a paper on uh, La Meurthe and uh, a great colleague from mine who's a professor now at uh, La Hague uh, in, uh, is in Denmark, no? Yeah. Uh, Netherlands, Netherlands, sorry. Um, did a, was doing a paper on the social book. What happened is that when the conference started, five soldier women and 30 La Meurthe people came in, stormed in the conference and started booing us. And uh, intimidating us and saying we were wrong about everything and so on and so forth. And we were talking at the end, it was really inspiring about the liberal scholars. I, had, I was having dinner last with a, a liberal scholar that was saying to me, Why did you not throw them out? And I answered to her. My answer to her was that that's what they wanted. Because if we would have thrown out, it would have, we could have said, oh, we were, our liberty of expression was restricted again by scholars, by people. Because for these people, scholars such as, such as ourselves, we're all liberals anyway, and we're only seeking to limit their liberty of expression. It's a great debate in campuses all over the U.S. right now, for all sorts of reasons. And so we did not. Surprisingly, we were able, even if, if I had a lot of boots and, and so on, we were able, you can watch actually all those conferences on our YouTube channel. It's really, well, it's not funny while I was doing it, but when, I, when I'm watching it right now, I think it's funny. But um, 
we resisted them in a, I would say, in a Gandhi style, a passive uh, no. And afterwards, they would come to the mic and not ask questions, but doing loud speech saying we were wrong. And at some point, you know, we would ask them, uh, what specifically were we wrong about? They would say everything. <laughs> and that would be that. You know, they were not able to say specifically why we were wrong. We were just wrong. And so, what happened afterwards? What happened afterwards is that a few of them contacted us. And since then, we've been talking to them. We've been doing exactly what the liberal, what we call the liberal scholars, and I mean, I consider myself a liberal scholar, but you know, uh, um, we're, because we were trying to understand, we were not judging it, and they could see that. Okay? But it's very, they're still very, very hard to uh, interview. Uh, if you're doing field work, uh, eventually with, the, with, with those people, it's very hard to approach them. And so, what is the portrait of the far right right, right now in Quebec? Well, the far right right now in Quebec um, is very fragmented. At some point, and it was a really interesting adventure, the group called, the group called Amert was able for two or three years between uh, 2016 and last summer to federate lots of people inside their group. Last summer, it just uh, one of the members tried to make a push of the leader, and so they, 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 the group exploded in, into internal bickering, uh, which is without, which happens a lot with the, the, the extremist group, all kinds of extremist groups. Because when you're extremist, you're not very prone to <laughs> make uh, you know amendment and everything. And usually in these groups, uh, when there's a, a switch of power, there's a push. So the um, the leader of Lamert, Mr. Malika, he got his call, which means wolf in in the in the Cree language. Oh, no religion in there. <laughs> And so, for instance, when you talk about the link with religion, Lamert was always saying, we're against religion, we're against all religion, we're not religious, and so on and so forth. But then they would, in their uh, text, there would be traditional Christianism pop-ups. There would be uh, recuperation of, spirit, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, Aboriginal uh, spirituality. Okay, all of their they saw Aboriginal spiritual neo paganism. That was the most fascinating group to study in terms of sociological religion because they had they were sort of a collection of everything, new age stuff and everything. And why they would give their name? They would give themselves, you know, names from uh, in, in Aboriginal language from animals from the forest. At some point, they even tried to say that they were the real Aboriginal. You see that in the, what you call the nativist, you know, or the first, the first they would try to appropriate. At some point, they went, they went to a uh, a reserve actually a couple of summers ago and they were thrown out by the Aboriginal. <laughs> they tried to, hey, we're your friends, we're you're, you're not Aboriginal, no. you know. But they tried. It was a really uh, an almost funny scene, but it, it's very. Uh, uh, <coughs> but but they were actually actual Aboriginal in La Meurthe, actually, okay? Um, so it, the, there is such a thing as a racist Aboriginal, which is, you know, bizarre, but it happens. Um, um, so, the adventure of La Meurthe was really intriguing, and I'm going to uh, have a book coming out on, on that in the <laughs> 2021, because I have another book coming out in 2020, on cults in Quebec. That one will, will be in English, so you can look out for this one. Um, but actually, what I discover uh, that most of these groups actually function as cults. With a very, very... Uh, the way uh, the Maika leader, um, Sylvain Bouillard is his real name, was able to keep this very, very iterative group of people together for a while. Uh, people who are not very prone to compromise, you know, is that he was, he was uh, controlling them like he would, he would, he would, he would control a cult. 
And I'm not saying the Jehovah's Witness or cult, but he used to be a Jehovah's Witness. And he was applying a bit of that proselytism that you know that you see in the Jehovah's Witness. So a, again, there's a bit of fundamentalism in there, a bit of a bit of religion in there. And the two guys also founded La Meurthe were two ex-people from the uh, Canadian Army who fought in Afghanistan. Uh, again, the structure was also very army-like, cult-like, but inspired by that. So that's why they were able to, you know, uh, control this group for a while. But <laughs> last summer, they had a poet in the group called Latsis Charlin. Uh, you cannot write two, two words in French properly, but he is a renowned poet in these circles. Uh, but again, it's very interesting when you're talking about grievances. You know? This guy, who does not even know how to write in French, is a hero. But look at the people who are making him a hero. People who are uh, dis disenfranchising. Disenfranchising. You know, people who are grievances. You know? Uh, from the interviews that I did with many of the people in Lamer, there's a lot of, uh, prop of uh, drug and alcohol problems. And uh, there's a lot of uh, psychological problems, obviously. But there's also a lot of people who are just... don't fit in. Okay? There's a lot of explanation for that. I don't think I'm going to... Maybe uh, I have until... I, got, I guess I have four minutes. Or, yeah, around that. So if you want to ask why, you can ask why the question <laughs> But uh, I'm going to I'm going to close. I'm going to. There would be so much to say, uh, but I'm going to. You can you can um, you can read what I all of our written songs. It's all available on the internet. You can watch our Sefir. Uh, is uh, we have our, our own website. Uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, and I, as I said before, I write in French and in English. And a book coming out on cults in Quebec, Catholic Integrist Cults. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in this book uh, coming in in the beginning of 2020, I did it with Susan Palmer. Um, I'm going to talk about the Père Blanc, the White Mirror, who are in Rougemont, who are Catholic Integrists. And uh, we, we uh, did a whole historical review of, uh, of uh, cults in Quebec. Uh, the scholar, uh, uh, probably the first. Um, the first uh, review of uh, scholarly, uh, uh, scholarly uh, research on cults in Quebec from the 1950s to today. So we did a big article, uh, uh, it is the first one we've been uh, published actually, even in French or English actually. But just to finish, what is responsible, what is the explanation for uh, the appearances of these groups. Right now, right now, these groups are more dangerous because Lamert has been fragmented. All of these groups are getting smaller and smaller, much more cult-like, much more fragmented, and much more uncompromising in violent. Uh, I have an article coming out in December on uh, uh, fringe groups that are called that I call uh, uh, far right survivalists. For me, they are the most dangerous currently in Quebec. Groups such as the Three Percent, groups such as the GSP, Group Sécurité Patriote, who are currently manifesting at uh, still on the border and uh, disguising themselves as soldiers. Yeah, they believe there are these guys are uh, are uh, far right survivalists. They're, they have arms, they are training in the woods. And you, there's many of those in the US, yeah. but right now we have those in Quebec too. And why we have them, that's another question. Uh, I would just you know, finish with this because there's... See, I didn't need a PowerPoint, I could talk for <laughs> hours and hours. Um, explanation. The general polarization of political ideas in society. Don't you want to say good example. You're either for it or against it. There's no in-between. Why? You know? For some reason, me, I'm not like that. Uh, for some reason, I'm for it. For other reasons, I'm against it. That's a whole, whole other story. It's explain it to you another time. But why do we need to polarize a lot? You know? So the more we polarize, the more there is this impossibility to have a consensus in society. 
Um, we live, the more we uh, are slipping into what my dear friend and social French sociologist Gérald Bonner would call cognitive bias. The most common cognitive bias is the, the bias of confirmation. You know, when you argue with somebody, they send you like a thousand websites confirming their ideas. But most of them are false, you know. Uh, we live in echo chambers, you know, where we live only with people that have the, that the same ideas as we do. Okay? And so we live in fear of the other. And the more we go into this polarization, the more it is impossible to talk to you. And I'm going to finish with a, on a very personal note. Because you uh, did a, um, a um, as you would say, you did a homage to your father, I'm going to do somewhat of an homage to my mother, who died recently. Um, but when you were talking about your father, and I was thinking about my mother, I, I was thinking you were living in two different worlds. My mother came from Dramangue, she was 100% French Canadian. And my mother, at the end, she had a lot of um, me mental problem issues, which was very difficult for her family. But my mother was also a racist and homophobic person, who lived in her own life in fear of the other. And I had a great discussion with her about it. Uh, for us, uh, one time we had an argument and I didn't talk to her for a whole year <laughs> because she was openly homophobic. She was a Christian, uh, she went to Mass and she was homophobic and racist. And it was, I tried, believe me, I tried. And she was too old. You know. um, the great thing, the great hope that I have today is that recently, I'm going to finish on that. Promise. We did recently a, um, a study, you can uh, go on a website, a quantitative study on CDF student in uh, Quebec. We did it, uh, the sample was in Tree Saint Jet from the South Shore, but, so not from Montreal, for, so from the obscure regions of Quebec, outside of Montreal, you know, that are deemed, that are deemed by most Montrealers to be racist and so on and so forth. Well, that got good news to finish. This survey you can look at on our website. We asked the question actually to our students. Uh, would you mind if somebody were a religious symbol in class? Overwhelmingly they said no. Overwhelmingly they said no. So I would say I uh, would be maybe against the La 21 vote. I wouldn't be necessarily against La 21 vote, but part the part with the, with the teacher because I, I don't say it doesn't seem to be a problem. Okay? So you see, we're just, you know, not going in polarization, we're just going in more, oh, there's a problem, this problem, maybe you should do this and that. But now, what we're doing with not only on in all sorts of questions, we're polarizing. Okay? So we're not talking, we're just polarizing in camps. And the students also, and that would be another reason why I would be, maybe not for Bill 21, but some sort of bill that would protect our young people, they are very tolerant of all the religion, but at the same time, they are extremely ignorant of all the religions. They know nothing about the religion. They don't even know nothing about their own religion, Christian. And they know nothing also about the process of radicalization. So they are very, 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 and research proved that it's the, 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 from 14 to 22, okay, it's the age where you radicalize. Okay? So that would be a reason why I would be for some sort of law that would keep away uh, uh, at least religion proselytizing from our schools. Okay? So again, we're getting into a debate here, and you, you can do it afterward that is depolarized. Okay? So that's what, and that's Andre put it expertly at the end of his uh, uh, speech also. That's what we need to do in terms of to combat the ideas that are coming from the far right. Thank you.
best to ask a question. We have quite a few people here ask a question rather than make a speech. <laughs> keep keep your, 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 your comment to a question, formulate a question to either of our speakers, uh, obviously in English or French. It's uh, your choice. Uh, well, please. And so on and so forth. 
So I would be quite cautious about saying that Quebec is less liberal than the rest of Canada. Actually, it voted liberal <laughs> in the last election. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, uh, in terms of, um, I would say Quebec uh, is not less liberal than the rest of Canada, but it's certainly a distinct society. And uh, for instance, you know, if you go to Alberta, in terms of uh, economics, I would say Alberta is certainly more conservative than Quebec, <laughs> so less liberal. So there's only one question that Quebec is less liberal than the rest of Canada and in the rest of North America is religion. And there's a good reason for that. There's historical reasons, okay? The Quebec province until the 1960s was dominated by the, Christian, the, the Catholic Church, which was closely tied with the political power. When Quebecer did what they called the Quiet Revolution in the 60s, they threw away the nuns from the schools, from the, uh, the hospitals, and so on and so forth, and they thought that they got rid of religion and they were a secular society. So the... Um, the secularization process in Quebec, uh, in, in terms of difference with the rest of the Anglophone world, was more brutal and rapid than anywhere else. Okay, even in France, the secularization started in 1905 until today. In Quebec, it was it happened in like 30 years. Okay, it, this was an so you 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 must understand that if you were in, in the, you would transport yourself in Quebec in the 1950s, you would find, uh, or just go uh, read uh, stories from that era, you will see it's an incredibly religious society. So Quebecers, especially the Quebecers from my generation, uh, had an incredibly bad experience with religion tied to political power, and they are extremely, and uh, extremely, um, Aware and uh, and uh, yeah, distrustful. Uh, what distrustful? Yeah, distrustful of any any religion that tries to impose itself in the public sphere or that is uh, try to impose itself in terms of political power in the world. So um, you can understand that they, if they see other religions coming in that are too visible. Uh, be, because they thought they made religion disappear from the the the, um, the public sphere, but could you, could you still allow to be you still allowed to have religion in the, the, the private sphere? Um, so they're they're extremely distrustful, and many of them, many from the far right, that we will uh, we are studying currently. When we ask them that question, you know, they will say to us, "Oh, we don't want to go back where we were before with the Catholic Church, with with what they did to us." And many of them, I found out what they did to us means that they were in uh, they were abused in the uh, pension uh, pension pension yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. uh, boarding, boarding school. They were in boarding school. They were actually abused. Uh, so there's a whole lot of, uh, of of history going on in Quebec that is not going on in the rest of Canada and in uh, the anglophone world, where uh, traditionally um, religion is more. Um, part of uh, daily life. Uh, also, and you must understand that, and it's obvious, there is the influence coming from France. Laïcité, as I said before, comes from France, and Quebec is much more influenced by French culture than by English Canada. Sorry, folks. We speak French, and most of the scholars we read in French university comes from France, and they talk to us about laïcité and how it's mar marvelous all the time. Uh, and so, what we are seeing right now in Quebec is a part of uh, French Quebec trying to uh, emulate the French model of laïcité. It's not so surprising. Um, um, also, and, but still, the Quebec model of laïcité that is going on with La 21 is far from France model, when even the students are not allowed to wear hair scarf at school. So we're still far away from France. So, to say that this model that Quebec is uh, doing right now is an extreme model, no it's not, France is more extreme. And there are some more extreme mo other models in some other countries. So again, I'm not saying I'm for or against Law 21, but 
you must again stop polarizing and again start putting play, uh, uh, things in perspective, historical perspective, sociological perspective, theological perspective, etc. You mean there would be more reactionary than a reaction to that than racism? Yes. There, there would be a fear. Well, fear is a big thing in the far right. Okay. I was talking about my mother, who is a very ordinary person. She was not in the far right group. No, but she was no, but she was very representative of the basic French Quebecers from her generation. As probably your father was, you know, as an Anglo Montrealer. He, he must have some prejudice against the, the French uh, Francophones, especially the separatists. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So, my mother lived in fear her whole life, you know, and the, 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 the phrase I heard the most uh, when I see people from the far right, but even people who are not in groups of the far right, is uh, they talk about an invasion. They talk about uh, 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 being uh, replaced. The theory of the great replacement is a, is a big theory. But in the case of Quebec, it's, it's more peculiar. I'm going to explain why to you. You must not forget that in Canada and in North America, for that matter, French Quebecers are a minority. And we tend to forget that. And as a minority, they are always in fear of disappearing as a culture. So many, many people who get into these far-right groups are obviously not necessarily... I always said, you know, Quebecers are not racist, they're xenophobic. There's a nuance. Being racist is saying you're superior to the other race. Being xenophobic is fear of the other race because you feel inferior. Most of their uh, life, the, most of their history, Quebecers have been dominated by Anglophones. Economically, uh, scholastically, the, the Quiet Revolution sort of remedy to that, you know. But it's still there in many of these people from my generation that are in groups in Lamarck today. Also, these groups, these nationalist groups that are uh, in the far right right now, they voted yes to two referendum and they lost. What can they do now? Imagine, try to imagine that, you know, you dream of a country, uh, your own country, and you twice go, in, in the last time you were not very far from it, actually, and you lost. What do you do? Many of them, you know, would revert to terrorism, you know, the, when the, when the, in the history of uh, movements, you know, when the movement lost, momentum and, and die slowly, in desperation, people could revert to, to, to extremism, to violence, you know? Uh, and that's where we see that Quebec is not a very violent place because, you know, after losing two referendums, many sovereignists could have turned to violence. But now they're in the Bloc Québécois. <laughs> so they're not very violent, they just go to Ottawa, you know, and to uh, annoy the Anglophone in Ottawa. <laughs> You know, I would not call that violence, but anyway, do you understand what I'm saying, you know? French Quebecers being a minority um, have always been fearful of their culture disappearing. And if you, start, and if you talk statistically, 
In Canada, if you look at the, the, the number, the statistic, they are effectively disappearing. French culture in Canada, in all of the provinces, and I've, I've been professor in Saint Boniface, I've been a professor in Moncton, in Acadian. Every year, the percentage of French-speaking people are getting lower and lower. They're getting assimilated. So, the fear of disappearing is a good, but it's not a good fear, but it's a, uh, it's, a it's real, it's real, and, and it explains it, in a way. And also, uh, but the good, the good thing, again, is that uh, French, uh, French people in Canada that are um, uh, speaking French as a first language at all is going down, but there are more and more Francophiles. There are more and more Anglophones in the other provinces that are speaking French. Actually, when I was teaching at Saint Boniface, the, uh, and, and it was a pity, the Anglophones were better in French than the, the, the Franco Manitobans. And um, that's a good news. You know, I, I always try to do a bad one and a good one, you know, just in order not to, to polarize, you know. No polarization would be today. I hope this answered your question. Uh, there was a question. Yes, uh, I, I had a question about uh, Canadian 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 Yes, yes, very uh, good. Yeah, angle for West. Yeah, yeah, this is very important, in fact. Um, people have a tendency of, of thinking that there's no such thing as the Christian right in Canada. <laughs> uh, but there is, in fact. Um, and and um, what, we've, what we've seen is, is, we see the Christian right often in Canada manifest itself through, move, to, through various movements. Mainly uh, Christian right movements that are embracing causes like anti-abortion, for example. There are two movements in Canada that have had political aims for the past 15, 20 years. One is called Campaign Life Coalition, and the other one is Right Now, that have uh, literally thousands of members. Uh, I've co-written a piece with uh, uh, Andrea Febres, uh, Gagné, who's not, a, who's not in my family, but uh, she's, a, she's a student, a graduate student, that we worked on this. And um, just for this election, for example, they, their strategy was to get uh, uh, elected, uh, uh, elected officials in, in parliament, independently of the, uh, of the political party, to try to have pro-life or anti-abortion uh, elected officials uh, in, par in parliament. And they managed, despite the fact that the liberal government won a minority, uh, the conservatives, uh, they, they managed to have more than half of the conservative elected officials uh, elected, like the, the, the people that they backed, at 56% are now anti-abortion or, or pro-life at the moment in the Conservative Party in the West. Um, so these are people that embrace Christian right ideas. And so what would that do to the official position of the Conservative Party? The thing is, at, at this moment, of course, Andrew Scheer, uh, because of his ambivalency on this issue, was even himself, as, as a leader of the, of the CPC, was not even backed by these groups. He what because they felt he was too wishy-washy. So the thing is, for them, they they don't they don't really mind if the leader is not uh, fully pro-life if he gives the backbenchers the opportunity of presenting a bill, which Sheer said he wouldn't oppose in, in any shape or form. He personally would not push it, but he's not going to prevent people from making a proposal. Um, that for them, if they have enough people that would push the bill, that's enough for them, you see? So what is that going to do to the party at the moment is, is, is this is a big question. You see, there are people like Jen, Jason Kenney that are not too far, uh, that are clearly, clearly aligned. Jason Kenney's 
uh, election is 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 due to the to the networking of the, of the Christian right in Alberta. This is this is very very clear. Uh, the same with what we see what we saw recently in Ontario. Doug Ford won the leadership of the Conservative Party because there were Christian right uh, lobbies that aligned themselves in and 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 the voters to switch their, their, their votes from their preferred candidate that did not pass to switch them to, uh, uh, to Doug Ford, who passed. So I think that, uh, you know, uh, the, the Christian right, we have to be aware of it. Uh, Marcy McDonald in 2010, she wrote a very important book uh, on Christian nationalism. She, it's called The Armageddon Factor. And in 2010, people were, were, were really, it, the book was not necessarily well received, especially in the media, and some people were actually criticizing her and saying she didn't know what she was talking about. But as a journalist, it was very surprising. I, I work on this, on these questions, and for many things, she was really spot on, despite, the fact, despite some of the negative reviews that she got from the book. It's a really good book. So I think that we need, I think that we need to be very careful uh, and not minimize the possibility uh, that the Christian right can mobilize itself. Because, you know, the Christian right, what it can do is it has the ability to mobilize itself because of all the networks that it has, before, because of all the connection that it has with, with a lot of pastors and priests uh, across, uh, across the land. Uh, I'm just going to finish with this. There's, a, there's an initiative that started last year in 2018 called the West Coast One Accord which is a group of evangelical pastors that got together and they garnered more than 6,000 signatures across Canada in support of their pushing for policies at the government level that are anti-LGBTQ rights, anti-abortion, uh, freedom of speech, uh, you know, issues around euthanasia and, and all of that, and, and making sure that they actually instruct and make sure that they're, they're, they're People in their congregations are aware of the values of the candidates for whom they're going to vote. They produce report cards on candidates with respect to you know, the types of policies that these candidates have. So yes, I think we need to be aware. It's not, they're not as organized and they don't have the finances of Americans, but I think we need to, to, to keep an eye on that and be aware of, what, of the possibilities of there, there are a couple of questions. I see three or four hands raised right now, but uh, we're right at the end of our uh, time allotted for this session. So uh, I would encourage you, we do have a reception. Uh, there's, there's some food and drink available downstairs in the main foyer in the senior common room, just off the foyer. Uh, use the opportunity to bring your questions to either uh, Professor Joe Hogg or Professor Gagné. Uh, take a minute. Uh,